right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Fire Builders Live. My name is Josh Corporal. We are streaming live from Key West, Florida. I have very, very special guest Marshall Cease Jr. on the show today. Marshall, welcome to Fire Builders Live. Thank you, Josh. I am excited to be here, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. It is going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait for this conversation that we're about to have before I get into it and all of the cool things that you've done. Let me just explain to those listening at home, if you've never heard Fire Builders Live before, what we do is we bring on experts. We take these big topics and we break them down into small steps, things that you can do every day to succeed and be consistent within that progress. And today's a doozy. Today's a good one. Today, I feel this topic affects everybody. It certainly has affected me. It is all about finding the energy to create. You know, we've all kind of heard of Pressfield's The War of Art and, and, and pushing yourself to be creative, but at the same time, having to balance life responsibilities and things like that. And sometimes it's really difficult to get yourself to do the thing that you know that you got to do, especially when it comes to your art. And, uh, and honestly, I'm honored to have Marshall. Let me tell you, let me tell you a little bit about what this guy has done. Uh, I actually had to cut some things out of this description because there were so many of them. Uh, serial entrepreneur, billboard charting record artist. You've been featured in publications, Variety, Billboard, Headline News, TechCrunch, Mashable, right? All of these, all of these uh, amazing publications. By the age of 30, actually before the age of 30, you graduated at a top 10 law school. Then you founded your first company. You recorded with a Grammy-winning producer, right? You joined the executive leadership team of a three hundred million dollar global consulting firm. I mean, okay, so <laughs> like, there's like some some very like widely um, eclectic interests there, and so I can't wait to get into that. But you then, you know, you raised millions in capital investment. You've partnered with Sony, Universal, Warner Brothers, right? You created your own music career as the Tin Man. Right, it led to the top of Spotify's viral 50 chart as well as the Billboard Hot AC chart. These days, though, I love your mission, man. Teaching other artists this creative success system that you have developed through trial and error, through your own life, that has helped you achieve your dreams. And now you're kind of doing the same thing for these artists. You're called it. You've called it Spartan Artists, and it's an amazing community and a learning platform for artists and creatives designed to help them succeed. And and so that's why I'm honestly, I'm so excited to have you, man, because you've just done so much in your life. I love all of this stuff. Uh, I feel like we're going to have a really great talk today. So again, <laughs> Marshall, seriously, man, welcome to the show. Josh, thank you. That that was probably the best introduction I've ever gotten. I mean, wow. I'm impressed with myself now too. Like it's amazing what life seems like when you just when you read off the highlight reel, like, all right, yeah. You kind of desensitize, good. you kind of desensitize <laughs> yourself to all of that stuff. You know, you do it, you kind of brush it under the rug, you're like, all right, and then you move on to the next thing. But then when someone highlights it and they're like, dude, you're a badass, you're like, Yeah, I am kind of a badass. I feel like <laughs> you know. So yeah, man, totally well deserved. And uh and so it's so great to have you. The way that I like to start things off, um, guys, if, if actually if you're listening to this, you can't see what I see right now. But if you're watching this right now, the before we started this show, I was telling Marshall that he's the only person that I've ever known to hook up his Zoom camera, his webcam to an actual like legit DSLR camera. That's why it looks so awesome, like his background and everything. Uh, tell me a little bit about where you are, Marshall. And what is a typical day in your life these days? Absolutely, Josh. Um, I am in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is a very recent development in my life. I uh, moved here in April, kind of in the thick of COVID. And so this is my home office that you're seeing behind me. I, I have a real design problem. Like <laughs> I'm obsessive about things having to look beautiful. Like I can't, like I'm creating a workbook for my upcoming course and I, it has to be beautiful and it's not good enough to just, you know, get it done. And so when I started thinking about video stuff and Zoom is consuming so many of our lives now, again, I couldn't just go the normal web camera. I was like, okay, I have a really nice camera to shoot my films on. I'm going to set that up with my computer 
<laughs> I'm going to create a yeah. background with lighting that's adjustable by color. <laughs> <laughs> I, is that is that like so the lighting that we see behind you? One, I would imagine you placed it there, but two, oh, yeah. can you change? You can change the color and everything of that background. If you have a prep, if you'd rather not pink, you know, I can I can do something else back there. If you want blue, <laughs> green, just let me know. That's awesome. Yeah, maybe we'll switch it up halfway through the show. Just there we like, go. <laughs> we can do that. Stay tuned. But that's, I mean, it, it just, it looks so good, both audio and, um, uh, both the visual and the audio too, as well. Like it's super important, especially today in today's day and age. Absolutely. It's important and it's quite frankly, it's, it's fun. I mean, I love it. It's fun. To, yeah. To mess with it. So what do you, so what are you doing these days aside from, um, you know, aside from coming up with new ways to design your space, um, what do you typically do? What, what's a day in Marshall's life like? Yeah. My, I like to tell people my, my life faces two directions. It faces forward and it faces backwards. And on the forward facing side of things, I'm thinking about what screenplays I'm going to focus on. I, I keep them on the ideas on post-it notes on my desk. So I'm like looking at nine different movies that I want to write and I'm actively writing three of them. So that's kind of how I, I keep track of, of the creative side of things. And, you know, my ultimate dream is to be you know, directing feature films, but writing them is kind of my first foray into that. And we can talk about kind of some of the TV stuff I, I've been doing lately, paving the way for that. And, and then there's the backward looking. There's, okay, what have I done that other people might want to replicate? And how can I turn that into a synthesized, clear, step-by-step -step plan so that somebody else who, you know, one of those accolades you know, stuck out to them, like, okay, let me teach you how to do that. And so I'm not one of those people who's just going to stop my creative career and just solely focus on, on teaching and building that business. It's, it really is coming out of a servant's heart because I, as I continue forward and hopefully achieve even more, I want to be able to unlock all of that, demystify it and then give it back. How much do you think of that demystification will end up being formulaic and how much of it do you think it's going to be like kind of a, a, a as needed like basis you know it's a it's more art than science kind of thing you know it's something i'm starting to find especially i think i think that's the beauty of having a diverse background or having diversity and in interests is you start to see common themes you start to realize almost everything works in a similar pattern right it's like um not pi was it phi isn't it that the, the the mathematical kind of you know how um different types of spirals and stuff are done and oh like the golden ratio kind golden of thing? ratio thank you yeah. yeah and you just start to see it and it's it's pervasive it's everywhere and that's what i'm starting to realize so what i really want to be doing is distilling down into kind of the the backbone and the spine of if you do this, it might look slightly different, whether you're a visual artist, a photographer, a filmmaker, a musician, but the bones are the same. And then, you know, what, what has gotten me to these levels of success is what I'm starting to uncover. And then hopefully as I go further and further and further, I'll learn even more and I can kind of keep digging up these dinosaur bones. I love, uh, man. And I'm just thinking about of all of the things that you have done that have led you to this point. Uh, you know, so you mentioned the screenplay, you mentioned the writing, mm -hmm. you actually, you mentioned the directing as well. And I'm, I love that you're writing screenplays because I feel like it's the exact same way as you, as you create films and you, you do video, like you have to be in the editing room. You have to be the guy behind the camera, like in order to understand how the story is told from every different point of view. So then, you know, you're qualified, then you know what you're talking about. I would imagine it's the exact same in like big feature films. Totally. You know, like I, my brain, and I think it's because I come from the writing background, like that, whether it's writing music or writing films, like that's writing blogs. I mean, like writing is probably the foundation of my creativity. And so to put myself in the mind of a director who doesn't write, who is just almost purely a visual medium storyteller, like I, I can't even understand that. I think it's amazing. And somebody who can just look at somebody else's script and just have, an, have a knack for putting that into visuals. Like I have to, I have to see it in words first before I can start to imagine it in picture. Yeah, exactly. Because it's, it's like the words are part of it and the body language, the visuals, like how it's portrayed with the, what, how it's blocked, like everything, it's all part of the feeling. Yep. Yeah. Totally. Maybe. Yeah. And so, so 
on this journey, right, that you have had, what's been the biggest challenge thus far for you, like personally? So as you've sort of tackled all these different things with various sides of your brain, you know, the, the law school, um, you know, the more of the corporate related stuff, and then switching gears and doing uh, more music related mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So far for you personally, what's been the biggest challenge? I, for me personally, I would say the biggest challenge is maintaining the level of faith that it is going to work, that ultimately it's, I don't know when, and I'll keep testing the how until we get there. Have, but not wavering in the faith that it is going to happen. And I've, I've thought like deeply about this because there have been so many times where I've been caught up in my own self doubt and so many times where I have felt stuck and where I, you know, you're constantly surrounded by people who don't understand that type of life pursuit who are saying, telling you the, all the grim statistics about how few people make it. And I'm, uh, you know, it's all about who, you know, which, and there's, there's truth in the statistics and there's truth and it is who, you know, but it is also putting together a plan as to how to get there and staying in the game, but staying in the game without losing the mindset. And this was a huge revelation for me because I, something happens physiologically in your body when you start to lose faith. And there comes a moment, I think, in any entrepreneur's life, in any artist's life who's like really trying to pursue it, where, you know, Seth Godin calls it the dip, where it just, it seems like it's not going to go anywhere. And, and you're seriously contemplating giving up and you start to lose faith. Now, this is crucial because if you keep going, there's two ways you can keep going. You can go the path of, you know what? I want to ease the burden on myself. I want to go easy on myself and maybe, maybe I won't win an Oscar. Maybe I'll just get to, you know, one day shoot a feature film and that'll be enough and, and I'll be okay with that. And you start to lower your expectations. And that is the most dangerous thing you can do because when you start to lower your expectations, you start to lower your dream and you start to embrace mediocrity, you start to exude physiologically mediocrity. And that's incredibly different than somebody who knows they're not where they want to be yet, but they can see it. And they know that if I just keep going and if I just keep tweaking, if I keep testing, if I keep getting feedback and I keep doing it differently, I will eventually get there. And they remain firm in that faith and confidence that I will get there at some point in time. You know, we're still animals. And if you're hanging around with a group of other antelope, you don't want to hang out. The antelope was like, eh, I mean, I might get eaten today, but uh, hopefully right. I don't. You know, <laughs> right? Like, come on, man, stop being such. A yeah, it's like, yeah, exactly. And do you think for you that 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 feeling came from something that happened in your childhood? Uh, you know, was it? I, I would imagine that whatever it was, it it you the confidence grew to pursue and push through the dip, as you said. Um, the more things that you did and the more that you can kind of like retrospectively take a look and say, yeah, yeah, that was successful. Like I can get through the next dip. But at the very beginning, do you think it was just because of who you were as a person or did you learn it? Uh, was it from your, you know, maybe your parents or people that you hung out with when you were really young? Hmm. You know, it's an interesting question. I, a distinct, in, you know, something that was implanted on me in childhood was when I was six years old, my father had a very secure job of selling TV airtime, but he dreamed of being a weatherman. And in fact, he and Harrison Ford, the Harrison Ford were friends in high school and they would get together in my dad's basement and like videotape themselves pretending to do the weather. <laughs> <laughs> no way. By the way, do you have those videotapes? No, but that would be amazing. <laughs> I wish amazing. I did. <laughs> and so he, they lost the TV station he was selling for lost the weatherman and he ra ra raised his hand. I was like, Hey, while you're finding somebody else, can I just sit in and try it? I really think I could do this. And 
they said, sure. So they didn't pay him to do it. He just volunteered to do it and had a knack for it. It was right when the Weather Channel was getting going. We were in Texas at the time, but he submitted his application and um, long story short, ended up getting hired as one of the early anchors of the Weather Channel and was there for 25 years. So I saw my father give up security to pursue his passion at a very young age. And that definitely wasn't easy on the family. You know, like um, there's financial realities that come along with that. But he stuck it out and ultimately flourished. And there was, a, I'll never forget, there was a moment when I was in college. I mean, he'd been doing this for well over a decade. And they just decided overnight that they weren't compensating their anchors well and needed to compete with the bigger stations. And so his salary, like literally, I think doubled or tripled overnight. And it was just, it was such a testament to if you keep on doing it, like it will, there will come that moment. And it's and and the universe tests your resolve because it needs to. We can't just have just anybody <laughs> getting to those levels. You gotta, yeah. you gotta want it. You gotta want it. You gotta definitely want it. And I love that story, by the way. Uh that's that's pretty amazing to see that. And and really, if if you grow up and you maybe don't have that type of, of, I don't know, of, of impression, of, of young impression to see that actually happen. That's why I feel like it's so important to hang around with good people, even now, even if you're in your 30s, your 40s, but hanging around people that you can see that are sticking it out, that are pushing through, that are being the best, that are following their heart. And then those are the best people to emulate. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, I can't imagine making it, you know, to any higher level without some sort of healthy rotation of your inner circle. I mean, we all have those friends who will always, always be there, you know, whether you made them in childhood or college or, or high school. But if I, if I look back and I start, I write down the names of here are the five people I spent the most time with and, and invested in the most heavily that that list has changed roughly every three to five years almost completely yeah that's interesting i've never really thought about that because you hear about the five people that you hang out with but you right. never really think about the delta right like the way that it evolves right. over yeah. time yeah yeah i think mine has too to be honest uh yep so well so as you're talking about that that the strength to persist mm -hmm. in a dream that you see right? That maybe the world doesn't quite see yet. It can be exhausting. It can be yes. really tiring. <laughs> yes. And I know that we were talking before about, you know, you've spoken to a lot of artists in a lot of different capacities on this very thing. And the majority of them say, one of the things that is so difficult is just finding the energy to pursue that passion, whatever that is deep down. And, uh, and, I feel like that's a real, that's a, that's a real thing. I mean, I know that you must have felt it. It very much so. And, and that is a very, very real thing. It's, and I think it's something people don't realize, you know, you kind of, people get associate artists and creatives with passion, you know, and, and it's hard for someone to comprehend that, wait, you, you love painting. Why in the world would you not want to paint? You know, like, and, and yeah, it's not, it's not that simple. No, definitely not. It's like they think that it's an unending spring of passion energy, right? When you're doing something that you love. But yep. if you're doing, if that thing that you love is, is not necessarily recognized or you feel like it's not being recognized by the world the way that you think that it should, that can be a very disheartening thing. Yep. yep. Yeah. And so what have you, what have you found um, as you've pushed through your own dips in your in your career what what has it been that has gotten you through like where did you end up finding the energy what did you tap into yeah so i think for a long time before i started to really understand where that energy came from i it was a waiting game it was waiting on that inspiration waiting on the muse to come tap you on the shoulder because that's you know for anybody who is in touch with that it's an exciting moment you know it's 
Um, I, I know, I don't know if in, in your world, what form that takes. I don't know if like all of a sudden you, you've been stuck in a certain problem and then just you're like going to bed and you're like, all of a sudden, aha, Eureka, you understand the problem you haven't seen for, you know, weeks. And it's just like, you get the, that rush of energy and motivation. It's like, I, I'm not going to sleep now. Got to go back to the computer, you know? Like, yeah. And, and you might only sleep three hours that night and it'll be the best three hours you've ever slept. So you can just hang out and wait for that or you can start to try to understand where it's coming from and what you're tapping into so i had this pretty monumental perspective shift when i did my first tony robbins event i did his unleash the power within event in la last year last march and he started talking about the six fundamental human needs which is easily accessible online if you just search tony robbins six human needs and it was interesting because he, he divides them. He has two spiritual needs, which we'll get to in a second. And then he has kind of four root, more personality type dr drivers. And one of them is certainty. One of them is uncertainty. Another or variety is another way of saying that. Then you have love and connection and you have significance. Something that he has found, especially with people who are highly ambitious, you know, across industries or verticals is they have very high drivers of certainty and significance. Not surprising. And when I thought, think back to like when I was pursuing music, music was heavily a pursuit of significance for me. Like I had something to prove coming from being an attorney for seven years to start my career. I wanted to prove to the world that like, I, I don't just play music. I'm not a guy with a guitar. Like I am somebody who can be on the billboard chart. Like I have this capability and, and I wanted to, I had some, I had a chip on my shoulder. And so I was hell bent on proving that. And that was where I tied my significance to. I had a definition for what was significant and it was being on a billboard chart. So that when you start to tap into and you tie whatever your project is to these needs, then you start to create fuel, but you can get tripped up pretty quickly. Uh, certainty is a hard one because there just isn't a lot of certainty in life. You never know what's going to come your way in the next day. So we going back to our, you know, terrified antelope metaphor, right? You, you need to have that kind of faith that I may not know exactly how or when, but I know there will be a time and I will find the way. And that is the only certainty that you can really rest in. But in really anchoring to that is key. Now, as you start to think about the other, you know, I, I kind of stopped there. And most people stop at whatever their top two needs are. And depending on which ones they are, can can depend on how much fuel you have and how powerful that fuel is. But what I started to realize is if you tie what you're doing to all six of them in a really powerful way, it's like igniting an explosion in your soul. Right. The way Tony puts it is if you have anything, um, especially, and this is how addictive behavior gets done. If you start tying three, even just three of these needs to something like drinking or smoking, and you start to like tie into it, it creates addictive behavior, no matter what it is. It can be working out. I mean, it can be something positive. It can be something negative, but that's how you start to trigger almost addictive type behaviors. Yeah. And so do, if you want to, do, you, think, do yeah. you find, do you find like by, by saying tying, I just want to clarify, cause make sure that I understand when you say tying, you're saying articulating the connection between say certainty and why you're doing something like just maybe honing in on one of these drivers and saying, maybe it's the uncertainty like am i doing this in a way that is like driving me because i want the variety and and articulating that for yourself is that what you mean when you say tying articulating is a great word for it yes and what i like so i've i have journal questions based upon each of these areas so if i'm trying to let's just say i'm going through a period of like oh i don't want to write i just don't have it in me i'm not feeling inspired i would say okay Let's certainty is probably the hardest one to do because it's more writing out and articulating a statement of what am I trying to achieve and an affirmation that 
I will get there and I will continue to test and try until I do. And it's kind of resting in that confidence that it will eventually work out. How does it bring me significance? And even now, like not, not if this, then I'll feel significant, but how does this bring me significance now? And then how does this bring variety into my life? How does this enable me to connect with people and feel love? Then when you get to the spiritual ones, this is where I found incredibly powerful, is growth and contribution. When you start to, okay, how am I growing as a person because of my writing? When I write and I continue to write, how do I grow as a person? And then the real kicker, how does my writing contribute to the world? How does this help people? What, and then the real, the real kind of clincher for me is what happens if I don't? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then write the bleakest, get Sylvia Plath on it and just write a bleak, <laughs> bleak journal entry about the world without you doing this, you without you doing this and the world without you doing this. And, and it becomes maddening and it almost like it, you get angry and it's like, I must do this. And, yeah. And yeah. You get almost get, you feel pissed. You almost get pissed off a little bit. Like, why isn't anybody doing this? Like, kind of thing. And then you're like, Oh wait, I can do this. Jesus. Uh, yeah. But I, I totally, it's like almost, it's a cool spin on the whole idea of like writing your own obituary. But mm -hmm. in this case, it's very specific to something that didn't happen because you just decided essentially to like to back away and to not do the thing that you're passionate for. I love that, man. That's, yeah. and the, you know, and actually here, so let me, uh, I'm going to put, I'm going to put a couple of things up on just so, you know, Sterling says, amen to that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Harry said you developed your passion and dreams into reality, right? When should one stop pursuing their dreams and passions? I feel like maybe that's, actually a good question for this point in time, because if you do connect whatever it is that your dream or your passion is to these two, two, three, four, maybe all six of these drivers, is there a point that you have found where you stop, like where you've, you've exhausted all options and it's not working. It's not, it's not working. And I guess maybe I might've answered my own question as I'm like thinking about it and saying it out loud. But I'm curious to what you have to say. Is there a point that you stop? My personal perspective is no. And the second you stop is the second you start to fade. And now what it looks like is a totally different question. And, you know, I, I was latched on to music dreams for a long time. And that started to slowly morph into film and television dreams. And so I, I mean, I haven't played a live music show up obviously not now but you know in a year and a half and i've got a records or more's worth of songs that i haven't released that i want to record at some point in time and i will at some point in time but it's not it's not my core focus so my dreams have shifted my passions have shifted and that initially caused a pretty massive identity crisis and i had to realize that it's all very purposeful and my it, it creates the uniqueness of you that you bring to whatever the next thing is. I mean, I don't know a lot of former lawyer, former tech entrepreneur, former, you know, professional artists who are now filmmakers. Every filmmaker has a very different path and it creates their voice. So I'm going to, I have a voice no one else will have. And that's the one thing everybody has. And however that voice comes out. So you never stop it might change. It might morph. It might transform into something slightly different and that's perfectly fine, but you never stop. Now you also have to decide what, you know, when it comes to goal setting, what you want. And if you want a very consistent type of, you know, income, then you either need to figure out a way because there are ways of developing consistent revenue with multiple different types of art and, it might not be obvious. You might have to have a lot of trial and error, but you can figure it out. Or you decide that your dreams and your passions are going to be more, you know, fulfilling from kind of the internal side of things. And you'll continue to do the day job and, and do the other on the side. And that's perfectly fine too, but that's a choice, not an inevitability. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it, it almost sounds like the difference between, between um, like a, almost a commercial artist and a regular artist where it's that choice that they've made for themselves. Let's just say, for instance, that it's a specific income goal. Um, you know, you have people on one hand that say, I'm going to listen to the market and I'm going to create something that people want so that I can sell it and make a whole bunch of money. And then you have the other handful of people that just say, screw what everybody else thinks. I'm making art because I love it. It's fulfilling for me. You take what you want from it. And, uh, and it seems like there's a big disparity between those two types of people. Yeah, there is. And art when done professionally is different. You know, you, you had, I love that this whole thing, you talk about consistency because that is a lesson I have continued consistently had to learn in life and just the power of compounding the power of being consistent with anything. When you're a professional artist, you have to keep doing the thing. I mean, I, I wake up and you know, nine days out of 10, I write for two hours from seven 30 to nine 30. I'm up at five 30 doing my daily routine, which is relatively new for me, but it's powerful. And I have to put in the time. I'll, there's a lot of times I say the majority of times I sit down with whatever screenplay I'm working on. I'm just, it is just crickets and it's grueling and it's taking me 15 minutes to write one sentence. And sometimes it starts to flow and it feels great. Then sometimes it doesn't. And that it's a totally different creation experience because you usually get bought into art because of the fun of it and, and when inspiration strikes. But if you're going to do it professionally, you can't do it just when inspiration strikes. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, you can't, everybody thinks that it's just, as soon as you're following your passion, oh man, it's, it's an Instagram feed. You know, it's just all amazing all the time. Yeah. Have you found though through your writing as you sit down and, and sort of force yourself to write that the tone of your writing takes on different is different feel depending on the, like the mood that you're in and does that conflict with like the overall story or is it all just kind of part of the process uh that's a really good question um and kind of quickly thinking back on those times i would say my writing is more flowery when i'm in the in the flow and it's a bit more clunky <laughs> c dot run <laughs> c spot jump spot say go here you know like and it's like like right. but i let that happen because i know that i'm i'm gonna be editing it that's gonna be happening one regardless of how in the flow i feel and it's in some ways it's easier because when i go back to the editing process i'm not as married to it it's a lot harder to edit something that i just like fell in love with as it was flowing and then you got to just kill your babies, you know, to, to really refine the, the art to be as good as it possibly can be. And that's hard too. Yeah. So that's a good point though. You're right. Like, uh, like even if it is a little bit clunkier, it just makes the editing process a little bit easier. So at the end of the day, it all <laughs> kind of comes out in the wash. Uh, yeah. and so, so as people are listening to this and they're sort of applying and projecting your story and these insights onto their own life, um, one question that I like to ask people on this show is, is what is, if you had to boil it down to one thing in, in finding the drive to create and to, to keep that consistency, like you said, what do you think that that thing is? You know, if you could just suggest people do one thing, and I realize sometimes it's, it's very difficult to distill it down to one thing because if you're anything like me, you want to give a more complete answer rather than like a more a brief answer because you feel like, yeah, that's the more helpful thing to do. But if you had to just d distill it down to one, what do you think that would be for you? That's, I love that you keep asking this question. I got to go, go dig into your archives to get the answer to all these questions. Cause uh, there's some powerful wisdom in that. I, so something I, I did that was, a blend of a lot of different books I've read or exercises that have been suggested that I've, I've found really powerful and it, it hits on maintaining the faith. So it hits on that and it hits on um, unlocking your, your energy and your passion is to record in your voice memos, what I call a reading of your pinnacle moment. So you mentioned specificity a couple of times. Specificity is so important. And so what I did is I journaled about a page of what I call my pinnacle moment. 
if I do all these things, if I go on to direct feature films or I win this award or, you know, I do, I release this record and then Spartan artist blows up to this. Like if all this stuff happens, what is a very specific moment in time, like a five to 10 minute window that's inevitable. It'll happen. And so I wrote this whole thing about being on the Jimmy Fallon show for like the third time, not the first time, the third time. And here's what we're talking about. Here's what game we're playing. Here's who's backstage with me. Here's what I smell, what I see, you know, with the, how the audience reacts. And I, I just like a short story about this moment in time. And, and then I, I wrote about how is this contributing to people? How is this affecting people's lives? And, and starting to, to either transform them or get them thinking in a different way. And, and I wrote all that down. Here's the key in the second person. So you, so that when I read it into my voice memos, it's your backstage at Jimmy Fallon, you're feeling this, you're doing this. It's, it's doing that, you know? And, and I, I set it into the voice memos and I listened to that in the morning and before bed. Uh, I have it practically memorized by this point in time, and there not a day goes by that I that is not fully in me, and I and I don't spend conscious time with it. But Dude, that I love that one of the best answers I've ever had on this show. Seriously, <laughs> for that that question, seriously, it really is because because it, it touches on so many things. One, the visualization and the idealization of what it is that you want, getting specific on it. Yep. But then two, the repetitiveness. Of, of continuously reading it to yourself over and over again to ingrain it, <laughs> you know? I, dude, I love it. That, uh, and so, so for you, does it change? Like, you know, you say that you've done this so over and over, like you read it. Um, my first question would be, do you ever revisit it and, and modify it? Does it evolve or is it pretty much like stay, like you're going to basically have that until it happens. And then once it happens, then you can move on to the next one. I, I've actually already started creating other ones. So I, I have two more that I have now now done. And one one of which is in regular rotation in the morning. I mean, they're so short. I mean, it, you know, when you read it out, you're, it's, it's probably not going to be longer than one to two minutes. And so listening to that in the morning is is easy. And I've written the third. I haven't started to work it into the into the routine yet. But, but yeah, is I, I consider it to be additive and almost like there comes a point to where once you've got one that is, cause I've been doing that for well over a year now, it's, it is just embedded. Like it is there, that visual, that image, like it is so crystal clear every single day that you can start to add to that and, and to the visualization, the more you emotionally attach yourself to this in your mind, inevitable future the more everything else that's going on subconsciously is going to come to your aid and help you get there. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and you're putting it out there. It's almost, it's almost an extension of the law of attraction in a way, like you put that out there and, and people see that and, and things start to happen because you're, you're making moves. And, and, uh, and so yeah. much about the law of attraction is things coming to you, but also you noticing them. And you don't notice things unless you prime your brain and tell your brain to be looking for it. It's like when you go to buy a new car. Like I remember when I was, I wanted to buy a Volkswagen GTI. This was years ago. And I was like, I love this car. I'd never thought about it before. I'd never seen them really on the road. All of a sudden, the day after I told my brain that was important, what happens? All over the place. All over the place. Like what happened? Did people just start buying this car all of a sudden? <laughs> like no. And, and that's what, if you don't do that, if you don't prime your brain, you are missing opportunities right and left. Yeah. I like, and you're just kind of taking what comes, you know, your, your brain, you almost don't know what to internalize because you've never clearly defined it. So man, I, I totally love that. I, I mean, I'm just thinking to myself as you're talking, I mean, I'm going to do that like tonight and try oh. it. You know? <laughs> I love it. And, and so the follow up to this, which I really like, and you sort of touched on it a little bit, but let's maybe let's dive in a little bit deeper. So let's talk about the consistency of doing it. You said that it's ingrained. You're listening to it morning and night, and you start to visualize. You start to actually see 
things things in the real world that are associated with what it is that you're that you're wanting does that help you then um kind of get you through those dips in a way like do you i feel like it's something that if you ever felt like you didn't want to write it's a it's a concept that you can always return to and that can almost energize you again yes yes it you know if you keep doing this consistently for 30 days you will I think one of the biggest benefits you'll get is a sense of peace and a sense of calm that you've told yourself something over and over and over again. It's, 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 it's kind of like you're mothering yourself, you know, like, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's like when, when, when a mother tells their, their child who's hurting, it's okay. And they just say it once. Is that effective? Nope. It's this repetitive over and over, almost rhythmic kind of thing. And that's what you're doing is you're, you're rhythmically telling yourself like, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is what's going to look like. So what's going to feel like, and, and you're going to, you're going to be like, this is stupid. I mean, you're going to be like, I can't believe I'm listening to my voice every <laughs> right. morning. Tell me yeah. about something that hasn't happened yet. That the, that the statistical likelihood of happening is just stupidly low. And but how many how many experiences have you had in life that are stupidly statistically low? Tons. Ever run into somebody you know in the most odd place? Like you're traveling, yeah. like Bob? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know that stuff happens. It's like it's why so not? Nice. Why not direct it towards something amazing that would be com completely life changing and less com random. Yep. Yep. So yes, you'll have more energy. You'll have more drive. You'll be able to do it. You'll get over the hump and do it even when you don't feel like it. And it'll give you a sense of peace that um, is profound. Yeah. Oh man. I love that. Seriously. I think that's so great. I encourage everybody see, listen to it. Listen to what Marsh is talking about. I, I encourage everybody that are, that's listening right now to give that a shot. You can do it right on your phone. What do you, you just record it like with voice memo or something and then listen to it. Yep. I'll usually write it down first and then tweak it. And then I'll just, I'll, I'll read it, you know, with, with pizzazz into my yeah. voice memos. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like kind of jazz yourself up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, no, I love that. And, and, you know, let me like, uh, okay. So let me, let me throw a couple of these things up. Just, uh, let's see. Noel says, Hey, it's the tin man. Motivation is key. Agree with that. Z says, love that. He's a beast <laughs> <laughs> going into beast mode on this one. And, uh, and, and so, and Perry and actually asked another question, what does your downtime look like? Um, mm -hmm. you know, if you go so hard in create mode, force yourself to do it. How important is it for recovery? Is it same as like, you know, physical? Yep. So I, I bookend my days. So like I mentioned, I get up, I get up, early enough to where um, today was an exception. I did not today. I was like, my body was like, I need sleep. I was like, okay, I will listen to you. Uh, but normally I'm, I'm up early and I've got two hours of time where I do my morning routine, which to me is relaxing. So there's a, I, I hit four quadrants, your physical, your spiritual, your mental, and your emotional. So I read, I meditate, I do something physical. So, so I've been doing some Wim Hof breathing. I bought one of those small Tony Robbins trampolines that I jump on. like just kind of get the blood flowing. I hear those are awesome. Do you it's like great. it? It's so much fun. It, I can't help but smile and laugh now. At first thing in the morning, <laughs> like I'm just, I'm jumping on a trampoline. You know? Does it squeak? You just hear the. <laughs> no, you can buy the ones that have, um, get the one that doesn't have the springs. Get the one that has like the bungee cords way better. Okay. Good to know. Yep. And quiet. Um, and then I, I typically do some type of journal or gratitude. And so that's how I start my day, which is very peaceful. Um, and then downtime, I, you know, I take an hour lunch break where I just kind of relax, do whatever I want to do, make some, you know, make some food. And then I shut off at five and I do whatever I want to do after five o'clock, you know, and I, and I don't check anything else, unless it's just one of those weird times where there's a launch coming up and I just, I have to burn some midnight oil, but that's not normal. And, and then I'll watch something on TV. You know, I love movies, obviously surprise. So watch a movie, make some food, wind down. I read before bed and, and then I try to be, you know, lights out at 10. So. What I think is interesting is that there might be some people out there listening right now that are saying, 
dude, you're talking about creating more, creating more, creating more, but yet the majority of your day, you're like you're shutting yourself off. Like I thought you would have just been creating 14 hours a day sort of thing. And it seems like it's not about the quality or it's not about the quantity. It's about the quality of time. And so you need that recovery time in order to go hard on the creation time. So here's, you know, I, I start to do some math sometimes just to understand the power of, uh, you know, not having to go crazy because usually if you're going crazy, then there are days you're just, you're doing nothing multiple days where it's just kind of like burnt. And I figured out that when I'm writing a screenplay, I write two pages an hour. So if I'm spending two hours a morning writing, I'm writing four pages. That's not a, that's not a ton. I mean, two to four pages a day. Okay. Um, I asked myself the question, what is the impact if I decided to take weekends off? And, and it's just two hours. I mean, I could find, and even just say, let's just say one hour, say one hour on the weekend. So two pages a day. That's four pages a weekend I'm not writing. Multiply that by 52. That's 200 and some odd pages. That's two screenplays. If I don't write for one hour a day on the weekends, I'm not writing two entire movies. Yeah. Now you can flip wow. that around. And if you're somebody who has dreams of writing a screenplay, you've never written one. If you just wrote for one hour a day on weekends only, you would write two movies in a year. I love breaking that down like that. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Most people just want to take weekends off, right? Not have yep. to think about it. But just saying it doesn't take much, just an hour. And that's, that's where the, you, I love that you keep talking about consistency because that is where it read that magic happens. Cause if you go too hard there, everything is balanced. Life is balanced and, and it's going to come back at you and you're going to get sick or you're going to be exhausted or you're going to get depressed and you're going to take a week off and you'll, you'll tell yourself that you deserve it and it's fine. And it is, you need to be kind to yourself. But you've also dug this hole where now you've just missed out on all sorts of time where you could have just been doing it with much more relaxation and peace in your life just every single day. I'm curious as to if you do this, whether or not you have to put a buffer there to mentally switch gears. I've always found that, you know, if you end up doing something small every single day and you end up having uh, things that are in different areas of your life, that it does take, it does take a little bit of time and energy to switch gears. But if you space it out, it's not a problem. Yeah. Yep. Space and nothing is key. And then finding where, what part of time works best for you, right? Do you, are you most creative in the mornings? Does it seem to be more like taking an after an intentional afternoon break? Is it an evening thing? And it fluctuates. I've had, it used to be in the nights that I felt most creative and now it's in the mornings. So that's just been a, a shift. But you have to notice that you have to pay attention to it. Like, why am I coming up dry here? I'll try it in the morning. You just got to keep testing it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same too. Like uh, I love mornings just because it's so peaceful and you're just, it's almost like you're starting fresh. Your brain's reset. Like you can, yeah. And, then, and I'm new to that. Like I just now I'm joining your camp on it, and I'm, but I'm loving it. I see that. I see the light now. Yeah. Hell yeah. It's awesome, man. I, uh, um, I, I've absolutely loved this conversation, Marshall. This has been so good. Uh, if people want to continue this with you, if they want to get in touch with you, maybe there's some artists. I'm sure there are some artists that are listening right now that um, that can relate to a lot of what we've talked about. How can people connect with you? What do you got going on in your life these days? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, when it comes to social platforms, Instagram is where you can find me most frequently. I'm this is the Tin Man. So this is the Tin Man at, uh, for Instagram. And then SpartanArtist.com is, you know, where I'm really trying to help people through these types of things. I'm everything we've talked about today, and you know, I'm pulling together into online courses and online workshops. I'm doing one this Saturday, actually. In fact, okay, how about this? I'm doing a workshop this Saturday. I, I called it Creative Clarity, but it involves kind of getting clear on what your pinnacle moment is. It involves getting clear on who you need to get there, what the path looks like, and doing some of the journal ex exercises we talked about to unleash your passion. So I'm teaching that this Saturday at noon Pacific time. And how about we just make that free to anybody listening? 
No way, man, that is amazing. First of all, that's incredibly generous. Second of all, uh, I think I speak for everybody to say thank you so much. Yeah, for man. That. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, so this, uh, without, yeah, so today, uh, what, what even is today? August 6th. So that's this Saturday, which would be what, uh, the 8th, August 8th? Yep, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. People are parians in. Oh, awesome. Z followed you. Awesome. Yeah, Z is awesome. Uh, I'll tell you, so that, yeah, that's incredibly generous. And the, the stuff that you're doing, like the pinnacle moment, do you, are you actually going to try and do it together with as many people as you can? Yep. That will, that will happen. You will, if you come Saturday, you will be defining your pinnacle moment. You will be recording it into your voicemail, voice memos and, uh, and more. Dude, that is awesome. Awesome. Dude, this has been so good. Uh, Likewise. So I'll drop a link. I'll drop a link straight in the comments of this so people can just go there and make it easy. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And we'll, uh, we'll make sure to include that too. I'll include it in the description we can put it in the comments and we'll also put awesome. it, uh, on the podcast and all that stuff so that people can, uh, listen to Brilliant. it. And honestly, if they end up listening to this and it's past that date, yeah. um, what's uh, what are their options? Do you, do you hold these things on a regular basis? Uh, yes. Yeah. So I will be, I'll probably do another one or two live and then there will be an evergreen course that will, will be made available consistently. So we'll, we'll, we'll switch out the links as we need to once, you know, after, after this weekend. Yep. Perfect. Awesome, man. Well, this has been so fantastic. Marshall, you're the man. I, uh, Gosh, I honestly, rocks. This has been great. I have been, uh, I I've been looking forward to this conversation. I can't wait to see the kinds of cool stuff that you end up creating here in the near future. Um, and, uh, and I just want to say, I really appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me, man. I hope we get to uh, ride motorcycles at some point in the future. Go for a ride I, together. I do too. I do too, man. <laughs> Vegas, it is so humid. We were talking about <laughs> Vegas sounds so good right now. Just the dry heat. Um, yeah. so we'll make that happen for sure. Awesome. Okay. Well guys, yeah, I hope that everyone listening enjoyed this episode of Fire Builders Live. We stream live Monday through Saturday at 12 noon. Catch us for another episode. This is Marshall and Josh signing off for another episode. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you. you bet. See you later. All right. We'll see you guys later. Adios.